It's time to get up. You stagger out of bed and take care of your daily constitutionals before making your way to the kitchen. As you walk down the hallway, you stop to glance into your bedroom out the window. It's still dark outside. You can already smell the coffee brewing in the kitchen. Your second-hand Mr. Handy is a bit janky at times, and he never remembers the milk, but at least he makes some damn good coffee. Still a bit groggy, you head to the fridge for some milk, and in a momentary lapse of attention accidentally open the freezer. It's empty. The rationing is getting worse. But you know that already. That's why you're up before sunrise and getting ready to hit the woods. If you can't buy meat, you'll just have to harvest it yourself. You grab your trusty old hunting rifle off the shelf and head outside into the crisp pre-dawn air. It looks like no one else in the neighborhood is up yet. You hop into your picker up and head cautiously out onto the road. You reach your favorite haunt and you park your truck in an inconspicuous place off the road. After all, you're technically breaking curfew by being out, and martial law is in full effect. You head out on foot just as light is beginning to creep out from behind the tree line. Legal shooting light. At least the game warden won't have reason to hassle you. You spend the morning slowly ducking and weaving through stands of saplings and crossing small streams when you finally spot it. A black bear. Not your ideal prey, but this time of year they're supposed to taste okay and your trusty 308 should be sufficiently powerful enough for it. You bring the rifle to the ready, but before you can get a decent sight picture you are blinded as everything goes white. The bear has already escaped by the time you catch your bearings and it's only now as the earth begins to shake and tremble that you finally realize what it is you are looking at. A mushroom cloud. And it's coming from the direction of your hometown. You're struck by a shockwave, but at this distance and through the tree line it no longer has the force to knock you off your feet and the heat to, well, kill you. All at once, the public service announcements, the safety drills at work, and the survival books and magazines you've been reading kick in. You were prepared for this. You hold out your thumb and compare it with the size of the mushroom cloud. Your thumb looks bigger, so at least you know radiation isn't an immediate concern. You frantically head back to the picker up and in what seems like a single fluid motion, you swing the door open, sit down in the driver's seat, and turn the key in the ignition. But it won't turn over. The electronics are fried. EMP from the bomb. The date is the 23rd of October 2077. A quiet Saturday morning has turned into the single deadliest day in human history. Winter is coming, and life for the vast majority of people has just become a desperate bid for survival. Back at the picker-up, you weigh your options. Do you stay with the truck, walk back to what's left of civilization, or head back into the woods? The truck's not an option. The temperature at night is too cold, it's too cramped, and it's too close to the road. You have no idea if desperate refugees are going to be wandering the roadways and how aggressive they will be if they encounter you. The city isn't an option either. Fires, radiation, no guarantee of food or water, and any survivors are going to be unpredictable at best. So you take an inventory of everything you have and prepare to set out into the woods. Your hunting pack is a survival gold mine, a sturdy knife, a rain poncho which can double as shelter or a blanket, some cordage, the small comfort of a roll of toilet paper, and a fire starter kit, flip lighter, ferrocerium rod, and some tinder. The truck also has some emergency food and water, flares, a spare box of ammo, a spare tarp, a hatchet, a small folding saw, and a folding shovel. You pack it all up in your hunting pack, and just as you grumble to yourself that your pack weighs almost as much as you do, you glance back at the mushroom cloud that is beginning to slowly float back down to earth. You steal yourself, shift the weight of your pack a bit, and trudge off into the woods. It's already midday and you have a lot of work to do. Your survival knowledge starts to kick in and you start prioritizing your basic survival needs. Shelter, water, and food in that order. In this weather, you can succumb to the elements in less than 24 hours without shelter. You can last three, maybe four days without clean water, and up to two weeks without food. It's about to get cold. Already, the temperatures at night are dropping down near 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's only going to get worse as winter sets in and that's optimistically assuming that you're not about to get caught in a nuclear winter. So you decide to build a temporary shelter. You string up some line between two trees and drape your tarp over it. You build a fire just outside the entrance and crawl inside just as the temperature starts to drop for the evening. It's cold, the ground is hard, and that poncho isn't exactly your quilt back at home but you have more than a lot of other people right now. The next day you follow a small stream to its source, a spring coming right out of the ground. Clean water. 
You once again set up a tarp shelter, and just as you are gathering firewood, you run into a rabbit. You don't even think. You just raise your rifle and fire. Your 308 is a bit too powerful, and there's a lot less usable meat than you hoped for due to the excess trauma. You scold yourself in the aftermath, wasting ammo and meat in one fell swoop. Still, there's enough left over that you don't have to break into your emergency rations just yet. You cook the rabbit over the fire and settle in once again on the hard ground. The next morning, you finally give up on sleep just as dawn begins to break and climb out of your shelter, shivering. It's getting cold faster than you hoped, but a fire gets you warm enough to start planning the day. It's time to build a more permanent shelter, basically a miniature log cabin. You start cutting down small trees with your little saw, and over the next three days, you piece together a cozy little shelter. It's partially underground, so you need less wood and it's better insulated, and you cover the top with dirt to seal out a draft and line it with tree bark so it sheds water. You also pile leaves on the floor and cover them with your tarp as a makeshift mattress. It's cramped and claustrophobic, but its small size allows your body's own radiant heat to stay concentrated around you. For the first time since the bombs dropped, you sleep all night. You wake up the next morning, there's a light dusting of snow on the ground. Your shelter's not going to cut it for long, but you're making do. You decide to go hunting and you find a deer. You fire and it goes down, but on closer inspection it's quite sickly. It's covered in bald patches and it has what appear to be burns and lesions all over its body. It's probably irradiated, but you don't have a lot of other options right now. You save everything you can, including things you'd probably rather throw away, like the liver, the heart, and the hide. Throughout the winter, you continue to build, to develop and improve your new home. You continue to stay in the shelter while you build a larger cabin. You seal any cracks between the logs with clay and moss. You line the walls with animal hides. Every time you trap a rabbit or shoot a deer or bear, their hides are added to the walls as insulation. You build a stone fireplace and the dirt floor of your cabin prevents fires. By springtime, you're a regular pioneer, but you've been eating meat for too long. You know what happens if you don't get any vegetables, scurvy, or worse. You know of some edible plants and mushrooms that grow in the woods during the spring season, but they won't last all year and you will need something for summer, fall, and winter. Also, you're beginning to worry about radiation from the animals you're hunting. The last doe you saw had a fawn with her that didn't look, well, right. Radiation is taking its toll on everything and you need to try to get your hands on radix and Rataway. So you decide now is the time is right, and finally brave the roads to head into town and find seeds and other supplies. You step on the hard pavement for the first time in almost half a year, your rifle at the ready, and start walking towards what remains of your old life, and toward the greatest unknown you've ever faced. You start to question what you will do if you come across another lone survivor, maybe a starving little kid that's lost their parents, maybe even a prospective partner or maybe a degenerate just waiting to stab you in the back and take your stuff. At any rate, you are prepared. It's a promising start to the post-apocalypse. Nobody quite knows what happened to you. The historical record is fuzzy in the immediate aftermath of the Great War, but 200 years after the bomb dropped, there are some very different stories of survival being told. In 2277, a vault dweller leaves the only home they've ever known, Vault 101. They peer through the harsh light of the sunlight for the first time, and in the distance they spot a massive heap of rusted metal. They walk toward it until they reach it, but this twisted mass of airplanes, buses, and monorail cars isn't the unfortunate result of vehicles which collided as the EMPs disabled their ability to remain airborne, no. This is a settlement constructed in the shells of these pre-war behemoths. As the vault dweller steps through the main gate, a horrible shrieking mass of metal actuated by barely functional jet engines, they are confronted by a giant crater and in the bottom an unexploded nuclear bomb. Scanning the crater for landmarks they see homes, storefronts, flop houses, latrines, clinics, taverns, even a church, all made from the rusted out hulks of pre-war transportation. As they step inside many of these structures, they can see daylight through the skins of the buildings and realize that there is no insulation, no climate control at all. During the day they are stifling sun-baked ovens, at night they are drafty, frigid coolers, and at all times they are disease-riddled, jagged hazards. Roughly 400 
150 miles away. A few years later, another vault dweller, this time from Vault 111, emerges near Sanctuary Hills, a pre-war suburban cul-de-sac outside Concord. Despite a Mr. Handy who's been diligently attempting to maintain his pre-war home for the past two centuries, even his charge is a crumbling wreck. There is no insulation left in the walls or the attic, sunlight shines through the shingles and past the ceiling tiles to what's left of the disintegrating laminate floors. Despite this decay, Sanctuary Hills is deemed prime real estate for a settlement and the homes are once again occupied as is. Not far from Sanctuary Hills, the vault dweller comes upon Abernathy Farm, just one of many farmsteads throughout the Commonwealth. The farmhouse is a two-story tall shanty constructed of old pallets, rotting and twisted boards, crumbling sheets of plywood and particle board, and jagged sheets of scrap metal. Despite the fact that wind and rain flow through this shack as if it wasn't even there, Blake Abernathy is proud of the home that he built with his own two hands, and his adult children have lived their entire lives within its confines. These stories of the unusual divide between the immediate aftermath of the Great War and the state of things two centuries later create cognitive dissonance on a level not often encountered in fiction. However, before we dive deep into why this disconnect is so problematic, if you are enjoying the video so far, it would mean a lot to me if you would open VATS and sync a few action points into the like button. Viewer engagement is a metric we use to determine what sort of content you are interested in. Also, just in case you don't know, we have a sister channel, Grey Galaxies, where we talk about about all things sci-fi, and the format is pretty much what you've come to know and hopefully love from Grey Gaming. Thanks for sticking with it, and now on to the meat and potatoes of today's video. So what I just described are two very different styles of surviving in the wasteland. The first is an actual semi-realistic description of how someone might survive the initial blasts of the Great War, and sort of a bare minimum of skills and tasks necessary to survive in the immediate aftermath of a nuclear war. Knowing how to build a shelter capable of blocking the wind, shedding water, supporting snow, insulating enough that you won't freeze to death in the winter or die of heat stroke in the summer, developing a clean, reliable water source, and planning your grocery list months in advance are all skills which would not only be necessary for long-term survival, but would also be necessary for your children and their children in order to survive as well. So why do settlements like Megaton and Girdershade in Fallout 3 or Sanctuary Hills and Bunker Hill live like the bombs just dropped yesterday? These sort of cobbled together shacks, shanties, and scrap metal homes would have been okay in the immediate aftermath of the bombs just to keep some of the elements off any survivors, but very quickly their residents should have been working on ways to weatherproof and insulate their homes. A single harsh winter or summer would be all it takes to render most of the residents of these domiciles expired. It is not so much the use of salvaged materials as much as it is the use of materials which are no longer able to shed water or block wind and sunlight. It's not so much the construction of wood shacks as much as it is doing so with windows that can't be shuttered and with crookedly nailed boards which allow drafts to flow through them. It's not so much the use of pre-war homes, but the use of homes which no longer have any capacity to shelter their residents from the elements. It is a complete lack of understanding about basic home construction and survival practices in a world that demands the survival of the fittest. The social scientist Abraham Maslow, or Maslow, depends on how snooty you are, created a model for human happiness, which he called rather appropriately Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He believed that for individuals to achieve a state that he called self-actualization, or in layman's terms happy, healthy, and reaching their full potential, humans need to have a number of needs met in a fairly specific order. At the very bottom of the hierarchy are survival needs, shelter, water, and food. Notice we brought specific attention to those needs earlier. If these needs are not being met, then it's extremely difficult to move up to the next tier of hierarchical needs and move closer to self-actualization. The intentional neglect of their homes paired with the scarcity of food and clean water sources all but assures a society which can no longer develop and will continue to stagnate or even devolve rather than rebuild and improve. The next set of needs are also extremely important and are called security needs. People need safety and they need some sort of guarantee that there is little to no danger of being deprived of a survival need. You somewhat see this in the case of Diamond City, where they have a large community garden, better shelters than most, a decent water purification plant, regular access to caravans, and the great green walls of Fenway Park force super mutants and raiders to attack fortified positions. But even then, Diamond City seems trapped in the survival stage, with 
most people living in filthy shacks, camper trailers, school buses, and though they do have access to food and water, a lack of caps can cut that supply pretty quickly. In locations where residents live in conditions of comparative opulence, like Tenpenny Tower, where they not only have all survival and security needs met, they even have progressed to the higher tiers, belonging, love, and esteem needs, which is they have the respect of their community and the love of friends and family. Even then, nobody ever seems to reach a state of self-actualization. They just roam the tower aimlessly, never really working to achieve anything greater than maintaining their current lifestyle. Now, the world of Fallout is a harsh place. For a large number of people, living in a place like Tenpenny Tower is beyond what any wastelander could ever hope to achieve, so it makes sense that a large number of them would be solely consumed with a desire to keep what they currently have. But not everyone is so self-serving. Indeed, there's no way to account for traits like altruism. Nature versus nurture doesn't explain every aspect of human behavior. Sometimes people will continue to be selfish bastards even though they are only in a position of power due to being placed there by others, while others who have every reason to be jaded, stone-hearted monsters have devoted their lives to being kind and to help others. In situations like Tenpenny Tower, where all hierarchical needs are being met, or at least within reach, it seems that someone, anyone, should be willing to be able to improve life for those less fortunate, or to try at the very least to build beyond their current circumstances for their children's sake. Away from the luxury of Tenpenny Tower as we so often see in our own world, many in the wasteland try to game the system. Even though their lower tier needs are not being met, they try to force happiness by ignoring the lower needs and trying to go straight toward fulfilling higher ones. We see this in our current society as people of lower economic standing and circumstances live beyond their means, purchasing the latest gadgets, nice cars, expensive clothes, homes in fancy neighborhoods, all on credit which they often and do not have means to pay off. In Fallout 4, we definitely see elements of this, such as in the case of Dukov, who lives in a lavish pre-war house surrounded by raiders and super mutants with no security and no steady supply of food and water to speak of, but he does have party girls who provide a false sense of affection and an ample supply of alcohol to dull the dark reality of his situation. In New Vegas, we see wastelanders come from far and wide to strike it rich on the New Vegas Strip in an attempt to gain security through wealth, most of the time walking away way penniless. In the case of Kate living in the combat zone, she is pitted against raiders in daily pugilism matches and abusing chems to deal with both physical and emotional trauma, sacrificing her personal health for the respect she gets as a champion inside the ring. But these are specific individual cases. The vast majority of Wastelanders do not enter the ring at the combat zone, can't afford to even be granted entry onto the New Vegas Strip, and aren't lucky enough to stumble on abandoned mansions or hotels. Most Wastelanders are just trying to live their lives in peace, far from the dangers of the bombed out ruins. They have no real means of gaming the system other than joining raider gangs, and even then, they usually only do so out of desperation or they have no choice in the matter. They don't have access to a steady supply of chems or alcohol, and when your only resource is a tato crop and a single milk brahmin, you can't exactly purchase esteem from your neighbors. So it stands to reason that for those that live in rural communities, the only path to happiness is through the pursuit of their hierarchical needs in their proper order each in their own due time. There's no realistic reason why basic survival and homesteading skills would have been permanently lost to time. During times of want, people don't just accept the inevitable and roll over. They start to think about how to get what they need. Just looking at recent American history, it isn't hard to find stories of accounts from World War I, Prohibition, the Great Depression, World War II, periods that were defined by famines, shortages, and rationing, where people find unique solutions to keep getting what they need. Family gardens, more extensive use of hunting and fishing, moonshine stills, co-op programs. A great scene from the HBO series Band of Brothers depicts a World War II paratrooper who saved his reserve parachute throughout the Normandy campaign so he could send it home to his fiance so she could make a wedding dress out of it since most cloth was being reserved for the military at the time. I remember when I was young listening to the stories from old folks who lived through the depression telling stories of going hunting almost daily with their trusty 22, not because 22 long rifle is a particularly good hunting cartridge, or because they liked to hunt, but because 22 long rifle ammunition has historically almost always been the cheapest ammunition around, and because its anemic performance tended to waste the least amount of meat due to hydrostatic shock, aka bloodshot. But most importantly, it was because it was either go hunting or starve. The resource wars in the Fallout timeline would have been no different and would have served as a catalyst for your average citizen to begin relearning many basic life skills, how to knit and sew, how to trap, fish, and hunt, how to garden, food preservation techniques like camping,
tanning or dehydrating. Your more gung-ho people may have even been raising their own backyard chickens, rabbits, and other small livestock, learning to tan leather, how to make black powder out of animal droppings, or how to build a traditional longbow. By the way, I'm not just making this stuff up. I have a family member that has done or at least talked about doing all of this, and they live within city limits. This is to say nothing of the preppers who would have been building bunkers and bomb shelters, stockpiling weapons and ammo, shelf-stable foods and water, and indeed, we see plenty of proof of those activities going on before the war. Even if they weren't, even if every survivor of the Great War was some hopelessly lost city slicker who never did an honest day's work in their lives, it's not like this would be an instant return to the Stone Age. Even when comparing to Tool Age societies, these survivors still enjoy a significant advantage as pretty much everyone who survived the blast would be literate and at the very least would be able to pass basic reading and math skills onto their children, which would drastically accelerate social development. We tend to take this for granted, but vocabulary is incredibly important for the development of society. Just having a word for a concept, an item, or an action increases our ability to approach, understand, define, or improve something. This is just one reason why political correctness and censorship is an idiotic, regressive practice and should be discouraged rather than enforced as it reduces our vocabulary and prevents us from addressing difficult social issues, but that's neither here nor there. Just me sitting up here on my high giddy up buttercup. Being able to tell the difference between a sprocket, a cog, and a gear, and where those definitions overlap is pretty much a necessity for someone hoping to design a new engine. The difference between steam and fog, even though both are water vapors. Being able to define the difference between telling someone you like them, you like like them, and you love them. Okay, sometimes English sucks. But the point I'm trying to make is starting from a completely developed language rather than building one slowly over centuries drastically increases the velocity at which social and technological development can occur. We wouldn't be looking at that same 5,000 year climb that separates civilizations like Mesopotamia and Egypt from our present day. Instead, we're probably looking more like the rapid progress that separates the late Baroque period from the Industrial Revolution. Farmers in Fallout should be building homes capable of shielding themselves from the elements, with safe drinking water and suitable crops to get them through the long winter. They should be finding ways to secure their holdings, building barns for their Brahmin to keep them alive and healthy, storage pits to keep their harvests hidden and preserved. After they have a safe place to start a family, then they can go a court and maybe pay that nice Abernathy girl a visit. Once those needs are met and it's time to maintain what they have rather than building what they want, they can start reaching out to their neighbors, helping them build their barns, dig their wells, teach them a new skill, build each other up, and through doing this, gain the esteem of others. This is the natural progression of the life of a wastelander, and nobody ever seems to follow it in the Fallout universe. They seem content with living in rusted and splintered shacks that offer no shelter, living in settlements that offer no safety or protection, wasting their labors on pursuits that offer little chance of change, rather than trying to seek something better, simply waiting for a Deathclaw or Raider gang to show up and end their miserable existences instead of doing everything in their power to ensure that their children suffer just a little bit less than they did. There is simply no reason why they would willfully sacrifice survival needs, especially in the absence of vices that offer the illusion of meeting a higher need. No explanation whatsoever. And quite frankly, this needs to stop cropping up in Fallout games, because the premise, while entertaining, much like this outro, is lousy.